So I grew up uh, technically on an adjacent property, but we always considered the farm to be home because this is where my grandparents were and this was always the gathering place for the Murrays. So I spent a lot of time here and enjoyed every minute of it. You couldn't ask for a better resource growing up. What do you do when farming is no longer a sustainable means for holding on to a treasured family-owned property? Join us today as we talk with Earliesville resident Steve Murray about his innovative approach to keeping Panorama Farms free of development while also establishing it as a local leader in renewable resourcing. Come on! My mother and father came here with five children, uh, not wanting to raise them uh, in the environment of New York City and uh, decided to come to the farm to, to make a living. And that five children turned into eight and they were all boys. Oh my goodness. And so the idea of, uh, of having you know, nearly a baseball team to play with all the time because back in the 50s, you know, we were in the middle of nowhere. You know, we, we had to go uh, down on Main Street maybe 10 miles to get um, to get groceries. You know, it was long before the shopping centers had moved out the, in this direction and development had surrounded us and the rest. And describe the landscape well, the, here. Well, it used to be literally panoramic, but it's still, it, it's a remarkable spot and it's a remarkable little niche that, uh, that we uh, have, are able to enjoy and have spent our lives trying to preserve. Yeah, and so farming was what your parents were doing, and you were helping to manage the farm Early maybe on. the mid-60s, Early right? on, yep, yeah. What so, were you doing, and what were the obstacles that you eventually were facing? We started out with cattle and, and uh, transitioned to sheep, and back in the 50s, we had 2,500 sheep. You know, that was the, the heyday of wool. And then we transitioned back into a cow-calf operation where the cow is the factory and the calf is the saleable product. Right. And uh, if you ask about the challenges, the most interesting or the most difficult challenge of all is, are the factors you can't control. And, and that's, in, that's in all agriculture. And that's, right. uh, that's obviously Mother Nature. Mother Nature's and number then, one. Yes, and then a wildly fluctuating commodities market uh, where something such as mad cow disease hitting in England can drive the price of beef down in Albemarle County by 40% in right. a 10 day period. Right. Uh, it's just ah. remarkable the way those things happen. So when did you start looking at this and saying, what could you do differently to keep the farm intact? When did you start thinking about that? It, it was a slow process, frankly. Uh, it happened over several years, but it, but it was the, 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 the discouragements that uh, of several different events. Uh, there were only two of us uh, taking care of the entire operation. We sold cash hay. We had about 200 cows and raising calves and, and selling the calves. But at the time, looking at the big picture, uh, I, I had to go to my parents and say, because they were bankrolling lean years, I had to say, you know, if we don't change the way we're doing business and start looking at this, this remarkable property, uh, as a resource instead of a farm. We're going to end up losing half of it. If you all die, we're going to end up losing half of it to keep the rest. So talk about some of the ideas that came to your mind. You just, suddenly your mind was wide open and you were thinking about everything. Talk about, maybe not everything you thought of, but talk about the ones that stuck and why. So the first thing that happened was that we dispersed all the animals. We got rid of excess machinery that wasn't going to be needed. And in the early days, looked at everything from you know, pet graveyards to spring water sales. Okay. It really was, uh, you know, we're looking at the entire gambit. And a couple of things kind of, we stumbled onto a couple of things. I had a son that wanted to run cross country. Uh, my brother, Drew, was involved in, uh, in mountain biking. And both of these were purely commercial activities. Uh, under rural agricultural zoning and so we had to get special use permits. Right. At the same time there had been a summer camp going on here and then within a year or two of that um, the Rivanna Solid Waste Authority decided that they needed to dispose of Charlottesville's collected leaves in a better fashion than they had been. So we got, uh, you know, a long story short, we got involved in the composting business. And then you have a niece who's involved very involved and she has an event barn. So she's yes. got this really cool space where you guys have weddings and parties and 
And so that, that is going totally, too. that's totally Margaret Bloom is my niece, Margaret okay. Murray Bloom. Okay. She created it, she renovated an old barn that we, as you know, when we were young, we put square bales in there. Right, and, uh, right. And then a uh, square baler turned into a round baler, and so you store them outside, and the barn turned into a storage unit, and she yeah. saw the opportunity for a business. It's really great to honor tradition, but it's also really good to embrace change. So in order to stay up with the time and the culture, we have to think ahead and not worry about the past so much. So we're always looking to innovate, always trying to be one step ahead of the curve. Let's go back and talk a little bit about cross country. So that has, has evolved into, I mean, you all have 3,000 people here at a yes, time. Who, who uses this? Talk about some of the things that happen. Well, uh, we host about eight events a year. Uh, the largest being a, uh, a high school invitational that usually has about somewhere between 30 and 35 high school teams. Right. But we've also, uh, through the University of Virginia, have hosted some high profile events. We've hosted the ACC Championship three times. We've hosted the NCAA Southeast Regional four times, both of which are coming back. And but, ESPN's been out and here. And ESPN live streamed yeah. the ACC championship uh -huh. last time uh, that we hosted it. So and the biking didn't really stick. The biking stuck for about six or seven years, but it was a totally a business decision on my brother's part that it was just too much effort uh, to maintain for the amount of revenue that it generated. So. Well, and and I talk about this. So this is a family run business. Now you're here at the farm and, and you're you're managing this, but all the brothers make up the board and Absolutely. every decision is made by the family. This is right? a business. And so any activity has to be scrutinized and has to be has to be approved by the board. Right. Any land use change here uh, of any type um, has to have a super majority uh, in order to to uh, to go forward, and so it's uh, you know there are bylaws. It's a corporation, and it's handled yeah. like a corporation. Right. We meet four times a year. All of the activities that we do here on the farm, we make sure that they are all reversible, so that as we evolve, we can um, be sure that we are not negatively affecting the environment or the land. So it's a very flexible business model for all of the different businesses on the farm. So we're out here at one of your compost sites. What is happening here? This, this clearly doesn't really look ready. No, the, 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 the simple description of a good compost is that it should have no recognizable characteristics of its parent product. So if you look at this material here, okay. this material still has leaves and twigs and little sticks and things in it, all of which will break down over time. And they'll, and they'll turn into something that looks like coffee grounds. And that's where, if you, that's where the description of a really good compost is that it has no describable characteristics of its parent product. So if you have something that looks like it has sand in it or sawdust, it's not supposed to be there. Not at all. It takes carbon, it takes nitrogen, it takes water, and it takes oxygen in order for things to break down. And so it takes about three and a half months to go from raw material to finished compost, and a finished compost should look like coffee grounds. So what, tell us what's happening out here today. What, what are your different workers Well, working there's, on? there are two different things, that, the two main things that are happening. We're screening off material right now because uh, as those leaves come in, they have sticks and twigs and golf balls and lacrosse balls. And so we've got a screening machine that's running, but we also have the brains of the operation, which is a compost turner. And the compost turner incorporates oxygen as it turns the material over. So it's basically inverting it in two different directions and kicking what's inside to the outside, bringing what's from the outside to that inside environment. Because it's that inside core environment that, it, that where you're going to get the highest temperatures, which ideally are over 130 degrees. And they have to be at 130 degrees for 15 days, right? We like a minimum of 15 days, frankly, we run 130 degrees for six weeks. And you have different different sites, so what's going on at the different sites? Well, they're all, if you think about all of that material coming in all at one time, you can only bite off so much of it at a time. Right. And so you kind of work from one end of the site to the other. And so we're at the, we're, we're now beginning on the last portion of the compost site, which is strategically located so that it's relatively flat ground. And you have family that are running this too. 
Right, and these these are sort of extended family. Okay. So I have a brother-in-law that's that's running it. His sister works for us. Of course, I mentioned my niece Margaret, and she's the brains here. But a really integral component is her husband Noah. He's the general manager that, that takes care of everything. We have a couple of other full-time employees that uh, that have been with us for quite some time. So everybody is working to keep this gorgeous farm as it is. You, That's right. you could have just sold it. Why not? The selling is pretty easy. This is a legacy. This was given to us by my, my parents that saw that living in this environment was was healthy, robust, gave gave longevity. You know, they lived well into their 90s. And so uh, this legacy is something that we're trying to preserve, particularly because the next generation is now deeply involved in it. And so are those their thoughts too? Do they want to continue this as well? Absolutely. What's, what's really important uh, to preserve a piece of property is not to have a cash call. If we, can, if we can make it sustainable so that the other owners, and there's a lot of them, don't have to write a check every year, then that becomes the most important component about preserving it. And down the road, way down the road, if this ever were not in your family's hands, what would you like to see it be? Probably a state park or a park of sorts that the public can enjoy. There's a lot of activities going on here and the, a lot of, there's a lot of public participation today, particularly with cross country. Either a, a public use park or an education center of some sort that would want to preserve it in its, in its existing state. It means a lot to be involved in the family business. It's always been a dream of mine to call Panorama home for as long as I can. Um, and a dream of the families to keep it open space for as long as possible and just provide a place to evolve and um, grow as times change.